Amen. Good morning. You guys ready for a big feast this week? You kind of like fasting to get ready for the feast? All right. Hey, while you're standing, would you open your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 3? If you don't have a Bible, you can raise your hand and one of our ushers will bring you one. We are in the book of 1 Timothy, which is right near the end of your Bible, open to the very last book. Turn to the left and you'll find 1 and 2 Thessalonians and then 1 and 2 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 1 is where we are at. And we're going to, chapter 3 actually, and we're going to pick it up at verse 16. So 1 Timothy chapter 3. There in verse 16, the Apostle Paul writes, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in glory. Father, as we open the scriptures today, I pray that you would open our hearts by just the work of your spirit and your grace here in this place, Lord. Lord, as we just sang that song, that there, there is a sense in which singing that song, sometimes there's a kind of like a cognitive dissonance. With our lips, we can be saying, I surrender all, and in our hearts and in our minds, we realize that there are parts of our lives at this moment that, um, Lord, are, are kept back from you, not surrendered to you. So I pray, God, that you would continue that work of transforming in me and my brothers and sisters here, that you would bring us to the place where we would willingly lay down all those things that, that might distract our attention from you, those sins that so easily ensnare and entrap us, God, that we'd be able just to lay those things down to you. And not just um, maybe sin, but also cares, Lord, that uh, we need to cast our cares upon you, knowing that you care for us. There are people here standing right at this moment, I'm sure, Lord, that have things that are weighing upon their conscience, that are concerns, fears, anxieties. And I pray, God, that you would just uh, move us to lay those things at your feet as we discover more of who you are through your word today. So speak to us, teach us. We pray this in Jesus' name. And all those that agreed said? Amen. Amen. You can be seated. I have to say that over the last few weeks, I've kind of had a difficult time wrestling with this passage of Scripture, just trying to wrap my mind around how exactly to approach this passage as we are moving through 1 Timothy together and coming to the end of chapter 3, this last verse for the last probably two weeks especially has been kind of like a, a speed bump or a stop sign to me. Every time I come to it in my reading as I'm reading through the text and getting ready to go to the next passage, I find that chapter 3 verse 16 kind of hangs me up. And I was tempted to just pass over it and move into chapter 4. There's some real weighty good teaching, some good truths for us to discover together in, in 1 Timothy chapter 4. But like I said, verse 16 just kind of kept stopping me and keeping me hung up. And uh, in reality, 1 Timothy chapter 3 verse 16 was more than likely an early church hymn or a doxology. There's a very good chance that the Christians in the early church 2,000 years ago, many of them knew these words that Paul writes down here at 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, as a, a statement that they would either say or sing together when the church would gather corporately, that a hymn or a benediction that they would say or sing would be these words, uh, great is the mystery of godliness, God was manifest in the flesh. This whole section of scripture here seems to fit with that concept that it was a bit of a hymn, very well known. And it addresses an issue right here at the beginning of this six-line song or doxology that they would sing. It addresses an issue that is kind of a central focus to the Christian and a central part of what we are getting ready to come into in this season of the year, because of course next month we're going to be celebrating Christmas. We're going to be celebrating that celebration, that commemoration of the advent of Jesus, or what we sometimes refer to as the nativity or the incarnation, that God became a man. And this passage addresses it, where we read that God was manifest in the flesh. And this was a truth that early Christians held on to and held as a central part of their faith even at the very beginning of the church 2,000 years ago, that they already, within 35, 40 years after Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead and ascended to heaven, they were already making this statement about that the coming of Jesus was the incarnation of God becoming a man. And so the early church, they believed that. The church for the last 2,000 years has proclaimed and believed that. 
And really, this central tenet to the Christian was something that didn't only start at the time of the church in the first century, but it goes back, it predates the birth of the church, this concept that God would come down to earth, because about 700 years before Jesus came, the prophet Isaiah was already prophetically, as inspired by the Lord, he was already prophetically announcing the coming of God in human flesh. And in one of the very famous verses of the book of Isaiah that you will probably see on a Christmas card or two this holiday season. Uh, Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, it says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel. So the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, you shall call his name Emmanuel, which we're told in the New Testament is translated God with us. God in our midst, so we can see him. We can interact with him. And Isaiah 7.14 is shortly followed by another very famous kind of Christmas verse in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, where we read, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. His name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. For hundreds of years, there was an anticipation among the people of Israel as the prophets spoke these words, there was this expectation of the coming of Emmanuel, God with us, and that when he would come, he would be the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace, the one that would bring forth peace. So you can imagine that they were looking forward with great anticipation and expectation of the coming of this one who's going to bring peace and going to bring joy and all the things associated with that. Well, because we're about to enter the season of Advent, just in a couple of weeks, and because we will be celebrating the incarnation, the nativity, the coming of Jesus at Christmas, and because this passage here in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, speaks to the doctrine of the incarnation, he was manifest in the flesh, and because we're actually going to be stepping out of the book of 1 Timothy for about nine weeks, starting next week, we're going to take a detour as we come into uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas and the new year, and so we won't be in 1 Timothy for a little while. We will come back, but because we're going to be kind of stepping out of it, it just didn't make sense to me to jump into chapter four and then put a big to be continued on the end of it. I believe God wants to speak to us, has a word for us here in this short verse in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. But I will say that as I was going through this, I just found it a challenge. And I don't say that to get any sympathy from you. It's just stating what it is, that there is a lot of truth, really weighty truth in these short words in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, and trying to figure out how to pull it all together in the short time that we have. I, I was really seeking the Lord all week long. Lord, help me to pull this together. But before we really look at what 1 Timothy 3.16 says, we need to pull back just a little bit and get some runway of some context. So if you would look at 1 Timothy 3 verse 14, we've been looking at this quite a bit over the last few weeks if you've been with us because this gives the context for this whole section of scripture we've been studying through. But look at what Paul says in 1 Timothy four or 3. 14. He says, these things I write to you, Timothy, that's the recipient of the letter. These things I write to you, though I hope to come to you shortly, but if I am delayed, I write to you so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of truth. Paul is writing to Timothy, the pastor of the church at Ephesus at that time, and he's saying, I want you to know personally how you should conduct yourself, how you should live and walk in the house of God, and then how to instruct other people to do the same. And so that's the context of what we're going to see in chapter 3, verse 16. And at the end of verse 15, there are three very interesting propositions that Paul gives as he launches into verse 16. This is like the launch pad for it. The three propositions are the house of God, the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of truth. First, let's take just a moment and think about the house of God. Because if you've ever read through the Bible, especially the Old Testament, the Bible is divided into two sections. The first 39 books, or the first two-thirds of the Bible, is called the Old Testament or the Old Covenant. It largely focuses on the children of Abraham or the children of Israel, the Jewish people, and, and all the things that God did through them and was planning to bring to the world through them. So that's the first 39 books. And then the second section, which we're in, the New Testament, the last 27 books, deals with the New Covenant. 
But in that Old Testament period, those first 39 books, the concept of the house of God, it shows up constantly. It's there all over the place, especially in books like uh, Leviticus and Exodus and Chronicles and, and on into Ezra and Nehemiah, you see these references to the house of God. There are actually 82 references in those 39 books to the house of God. And I went through and I read every single one of those this last week and all but one of them, 81 of them all speak about the same exact thing when it mentions the house of God. The house of God for the Jewish mind under the old covenant was the temple or the tabernacle. You see, the children of Israel, they ended up as slaves in Egypt. If you've ever seen the Prince of Egypt or the Ten Commandments or that movie that came out a few years ago with Christian Bale, um, then you understand that story. The children of Israel were in Egypt as slaves and God said to Moses, go talk to Pharaoh and say, let my people go. So Moses goes to Pharaoh, says, let my people go. There's this battle back and forth and God shows up and brings plagues and ultimately the children of Israel leave Egypt. And it was about 3,400 years ago. And they go into the wilderness and they meet before God at a mountain called Mount Sinai and there God gives them the law. But he also says that I want you to be my people and my people are going to come to meet before me and you're going to meet with me at this place called the tabernacle. You're going to build this tent basically and that's where they would go and offer their offerings and their sacrifices to God at the tabernacle. And the amazing thing is, is that when God set this up in the book of Exodus, he said that the entire nation of the people of Israel, they were all camping at that time for 40 years, they camped. Uh, they had a lot more strength than I would have. Uh, but there in that point, they camped around the tabernacle. The central focus of their life was what took place at the tabernacle, at the house of God. And then when they ultimately got into the promised land about 40 years later and God gives them rest there, when they finally have taken hold of that land, they move from having a tabernacle to having a temple. And under the King Solomon, the temple was, was built up and the people had that place as their focal point. In fact, three times a year, a faithful Jewish person, a faithful Jewish man would take his family up to Jerusalem to go to the house of God, to celebrate the three major times of feasts for Passover and Pentecost and tabernacles at the end of the year. They would gather together there at the temple, at the house of God. And you can read in the Psalms especially, there's all kinds of stuff about going up to the house of God. And you can imagine that if, if you were among those people going up to the house of God, you would be preparing yourself. You'd be preparing your heart. You'd be preparing yourself emotionally and spiritually and even physically. When you came to Jerusalem, you would, you would wash in a ceremonial cleansing, a ceremonial bath so that you're prepared to come to the house of God. The idea of going to the house of God was a really big deal. And you wanted to make sure that your life was in order, that you were conducting yourself right when you were there at the house of God. And so for 1,500 years, this was the center focus of the Jewish people, and then it just kind of disappears. And, and the major reason that it disappears was back in the year 70 AD, just about five or six years after Paul would write this letter, the temple in Jerusalem would be destroyed by the Romans. And it would no longer be the center focus for the Jewish people because the temple would be gone. The amazing thing is, is that ever since then, for the last 1900 years, there have been many people who are faithful Jewish individuals who still long for the temple. They still look at that ground that the temple was built upon, the temple mount there, as being a place of holy reverence. And, and if you go there, you approach it reverently. And they don't even go on the temple mount. They only go to the wall that is uh, the supporting wall on the western side, the wailing wall, is where they go and they go with re great uh, reverence when they approach it because they see that as the place of the house of God. But like I said, the, the concept all but disappears when Jesus, our Messiah, comes. That for 1,400, 1,500 years, the house of God was prominent to the people of God, but then after the coming of Jesus, it, it's basically gone. It, it's referenced 81 times in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament, it's only referenced six times. And three of those times are direct quotes to the Old Testament talking about the Old Covenant and the temple. The other three completely change the concept of the idea of the house of God for the people of God. And we see that here in this passage in 1 Timothy chapter 3. There in verse 15, Paul says, he's writing to Christians and he says, I want you to know how to conduct yourselves, followers of Jesus, how do you conduct yourselves when you go to the house of God, when you're in the house of God? But where is that? What exactly is the house of God? We know under the old covenant there was a temple. 
or there was a tabernacle. But now under the new covenant, what, what do you mean when you say, when you are in the house of God, this is how you should conduct yourself? Well, where is it? Well, it's not a place. Because notice what he says. The house of God is the church of the living God. Point number one on your outline. Sermon guide should be in your bulletin. Point number one. The house of God is no longer a place. It's a people. The house of God is no longer a place. It's a people. So if you are a Christian today, if you're a follower of God, then you are a part of of the people of the living God. You're a part of the church. The word church just means a gathering of people. So if you're a follower of Jesus, you're a part of the gathering of people of the living God. You're a part of the church and you are corporately and individually, you are the house of God. This is why Paul twice in his letter to the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians, he would say, you the church are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And then he would say, you, the Christian individual, you're the dwelling place, the temple of the Holy Spirit. We don't have a physical location, a place that we go to, to encounter God in his house. Because if you're a Christian, then you individually and corporately, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Jesus told his disciples in John's gospel, chapter 16, the Holy Spirit is with you and he shall be in you. And then at the end of the gospel of John, he breathes on his disciples and he says, receive ye the Holy Spirit. And then they became the dwelling place of the Spirit of God. So you, Christian, are the house of God. Now, whether you realize it or not, this concept is absolutely amazing and it has very weighty implications. Why is it amazing and why does it have such heavy implications? Well, I don't know if you've noticed, but human beings for some reason, like to have holy places and holy spaces. There's something about our nature and our makeup that makes it that we really long for an actual location that is holy and that is set aside and that is kind of reverent and spiritual. Whether you're a Christian or not a Christian, there is this desire in us for those holy places. So they're all over the world. In every different religion, you have temples, and you have mosques, and you have synagogues, and you have, for the Christians, you have basilicas, and cathedrals, and great churches, and all these sort of things. And and there's a sense in us that seems to draw us to these places that are holy. And even for a lot of Christians who understand doctrine in the Bible, sometimes we, we wrongly fall into that mindset. And so we'll call this building right here at 1675 Seven Oaks Road, we'll say, this is the house of God even though doctrinally that, that's not really true because you, the people of God, are the house of God. This is just a place where we meet. But wherever you go, that's the house of God. And, and the fact is, we would rather have a location that is the holy place because if we had a location that was the holy place and we go to that holy place, then that would make our life a little bit easier. Why? Because just once a week or, you know, maybe once a month or maybe just once a year, we would have to kind of get ourselves set up and kind of work up the ability to try and be holy for a really short period of time to go to that place. I only have to conduct myself holy when I'm there. That would be a lot easier, wouldn't it? If you only ever had to conduct yourself in holy righteousness when you came to this place, that would be really, really simple. You mean for 75 minutes on a Sunday, that's the only time I got to do it all week long? I'm in. We would like that in our flesh to just go to a holy place, but we're not given that option by God because he says it's not about a location any longer. It's not a place. It's a people. So what's the implication of that? That means that if you're a Christian today, wherever you go, you're representing the house of God. So if you're at your home in your neighborhood, or you're on a construction site, or in an office building, or on a school campus, or at the gas station, wherever you are as a Christian, you are representing the house of God. That's a phenomenal thing to consider. Because we we all understand going to a holy place and conducting ourselves in kind of a reverential and spiritual way when we're there, but do we realize that if we're Christians, we've been so transformed by God that now wherever we go, we need to conduct ourselves in a way that is honoring and glorifying to him. And that is phenomenally challenging. Phenomenally challenging. But why? Why should we have to do this? Why should we, Christians, seek to alter our conduct wherever we are? Well, 
it's the reason is given to us in the very last proposition of verse 15. Look back at 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15. You should know how to conduct yourself in the house of God, the church of the living God, which is the pillar and ground of truth. Why must we Christians, why must we, the church, conduct ourselves rightly wherever we go and not just when we come to this place? Because we, Christians, the church, we are the grounding foundation of the truth. Point number two on your outline. The church possesses and proclaims the truth. The church possesses and proclaims the truth. And and I'm emphasizing the words the truth. Not a truth, the truth. That the body of Christ, the house of God, the Christians, they have and they hold and they share or lift up for all others to see what is the truth. Now at that point, there may be some that go, man, that's a pretty audacious claim that the church has a corner market on the truth. That's a pretty heavy statement. And so some might think, wait, does that mean that everything outside the church or outside the Bible is not true? That everything outside the church and outside the Bible is false, that it's a lie? No, that's not exactly what I'm saying. What I am saying is that the Bible, while it does not contain all true things that could ever be known, There are other true things that we can discover in the universe outside of the church or outside of the Bible, but the Bible does contain what I would call the antecedent truth. There's nothing that precedes it. So the Bible and the church have what is the fundamental truth, the fundamental truth that creates the construct of reality that all other truths will have to align with or accord with. You see, The idea or the concept of truth is that which aligns with reality. Anything that aligns with reality is said to be true. But what is the foundational, fundamental, antecedent truth that sets reality, that establishes what is real and what is right? Well, as we see here, it's the scriptures. The scriptures and the church has, they possess the very fundamental truth upon which every other truth claim is judged by. Every other truth claim has to align with what the scriptures have to say. In other words, if you get the fundamental truth wrong, then every other deduction that you'll come up with will be false. If you start with a false premise, then every deduction that comes from that false premise will be wrong. Let me illustrate it like this. If I was able over weeks and weeks and weeks to convince you that this is the color red, And every week I work to convince you, this is the color red. At first you go, no, that's not the color red, that's the color black. But after a while, maybe I finally convince all of you to say, that's the color red. That would alter your observation of everything else in the world. And and as you would go around and you'd be with people who don't go to this church and don't agree that this is the color red, then after a while you'd say, oh yeah, look at that red dog over there. You go, it's not a red dog. Your your neighbor, your friend, your family, they go, what's wrong with him? That's not red. You go, oh, check out that really cool red car. That's not a red car. What are you talking about? It would alter, that change of premise would alter your entire understanding, observation of the world. That fundamental premise or or statement would change how you see the world, how you observe everything, the, the conclusions that you come to. This is a really important concept. It was illustrated perfectly perfectly for me just a couple of weeks ago. Um, I stumbled upon a video online, and maybe some of you guys have seen TED Talks before. I I watch those from time to time. And there was one that caught my eye. The title was, The History of the Universe in 18 Minutes. And I thought, ooh, that that could be interesting. So I I, I can learn on the history of the universe in 18 minutes. I'll take it. And I even watched it at one and a half speed. So it was less time. It was awesome. So so I'm watching this video, and and the guy who's presenting, I believe his name was David Christian. And, And... the only thing Christian about him was his name. So um, he, he gets up there and he starts this thing I- incredibly well. He draws in all the people watching. These people, there's thousands of people in this auditorium at a TED conference. They all paid 10 grand to go to that conference. $10,000. They're watching that. You can watch it for free online. I mean, that's just the dumbest investment ever, I'm telling you. So, so they're all there and he starts this thing and he just grips the audience so well right off the bat because he shows a video to start his message. And it's a video of an egg being mixed 
or, or an egg being, you know, whipped up. And, and as you're watching it, you realize that it's actually going in reverse, and that egg is reconstituting and recompiling back into a yolk and separating from the white, and then sucking back up into the eggshell, and then the eggshell gets uncracked and set aside. And every person watching that video goes, no, that's wrong. And the presenter says, you're all kind of having an issue with watching that because you know that what you just saw with your eyes does not align with reality. It doesn't fit with what you know to be true or real because what you saw in that video is going against one of the fundamental principles of physics called the second law of thermodynamics, the law of entropy. And the law of entropy simply says that everything goes from a state of order to disorder, from order to chaos. It's like your kid's room. It goes from a state of order to chaos. And we know intuitively that that is true. And so he starts off this talk, and he's doing such a good job of drawing people into that acknowledgement that what I just saw with my eyes is not accord with reality because things go from a state of order to chaos and not in reverse. And then he says this, but that's not always the case in the universe. Because sometimes in the universe, for some reason, the universe goes from a state of chaos to order. And for the next 18 minutes, he explains this in a very... Well, you know, an amazing way that sounds really good. In fact, it sounds like, oh, this guy's so smart and he could be so right on and he could be so true. But the reason he comes to the conclusions that he does is because he has a foundational principle, a fundamental truth, and it is this. There is no God. That's his fundamental starting point. He holds to the premise that there is no God. And then if there is no God, how do I explain everything that I see that is so perfectly ordered in a world that physics says goes from order to chaos? I have to explain it some other way. I have to say that sometimes, I don't understand the conditions, but sometimes the universe just goes opposite the second law of thermodynamics. Can you see why having the initial fundamental truth is so essential? To know what is the founding principle is so important? What then is the fundamental antecedent truth that the church possesses and proclaims? Paul says that we Christians are the pillar and ground of truth. We're the foundational support for the truth. Well, he says this in the form of a hymn, a doxology. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. Only took me 20 minutes to get back there. And without controversy... Great is the mystery of godliness. Let's stop there. He says, beyond a shadow of a doubt, without a doubt, what I'm going to tell you is a great mystery. Now, some people have a hard time with mystery. Things that are hard to grasp, hard to understand, or cannot be understood without revelation. You realize that those who are in the scientific community that are researchers, they don't have a problem with mystery because those things that they are studying is trying to unlock things that they don't quite understand. They're trying to figure out the mysteries of the universe. And so mystery is not a major problem to them because they say, listen, there's a lot of mystery in the world. We don't know what is the fabric, the glue that holds everything together. We don't understand exactly how gravity works. We don't understand fully antimatter or dark matter. We don't understand a lot of those things. These are mysteries, but they're looking to try and figure those unsolved mysteries out. And here Paul says, listen, I want to tell you something that is a great mystery. Without a doubt, without controversy, Great is the mystery of godliness. Great is the mystery of who God is and how God interacts with us and how we become godly to interact with him. That is a mysterious thing. And so he identifies this concept, the idea of a biblical mystery. You see, the Bible talks quite a bit about mystery, and a biblical mystery is a concept or an idea that cannot be known apart from revelation. And here's the awesome thing about God. You cannot know who God is, what he's like, and what he wants apart from him revealing it to us. It's a mystery that has to be revealed. Now, that's not to say that we can't say, learn certain things about God by looking at the universe. As we look at this finely tuned and perfectly intricately designed universe, the invisible attributes of God are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made so that we are without excuse, says Romans chapter 1. When we look at the structure of DNA... When we look at the design of the eye, 
when we realize that there are more than 200 finely tuned, important things in our universe that are set just right so that life is sustained here on this planet. When we realize that, we see that the cosmos, creation, points and says there is a God. But he's a mystery to us. What is he like? What does he want? For that, it has to be revealed. It's a mystery. He has to reveal himself to us. Now, the perfect illustration of the idea of a biblical mystery is something that many of you will engage in in just a few weeks when you exchange Christmas gifts. You see, a Christmas gift is the perfect illustration of a biblical mystery. Maybe you have a loved one that you buy something for, some tangible object, some thing, and you place it into a box, and you close that box, and you wrap that box, and you put a bow on that box. And maybe, if, like my family, you put it under a tree for an appointed day for that to be revealed. But what is inside the box is unknown by the recipient. It's a mystery. Some people drive them nuts. My wife is one of those people. It just makes her crazy. And I, I, I'll admit it, I confess, I thrive on torturing my wife with Christmas present. So just last night, I told her, I got your Christmas present all done today. And, and I just know, just by saying that, it just triggers like a month and five or six days of her just going, what is it? Come on, give me a clue. Is it something? She already started last night. Is it something that I told you I wanted? What is it? She, she, she cannot contain herself. And I thrive on it. And so all the way up until Christmas, she'll be saying, well, can I open it early, please? Can I open it? And I go, nope, 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 nope. I mean, even like, it'll be 11.59 on Christmas Eve. I go, sorry, you're going to have to wait until tomorrow morning. It drives her nuts. And that which is wrapped, that which is hidden, it has to be revealed to be known. And this is the idea of this mystery of godliness. It cannot be known unless it is revealed. Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. And thank God for the next line. God was manifest in the flesh. God was manifest in the flesh. Point number three on your outline. Jesus brought to light the glory and majesty of God. Jesus brought to light the glory and majesty of God. God cannot be found in a test tube, in a telescope, through a microscope. He is independent of his creation, stands outside of his creation, and we would not know what he is like and what he wants if Jesus did not step into our world if he was not manifest in the flesh. God was manifest in the flesh. Jesus brings to light the glory and majesty of God. God who, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 16 says, no man has seen or can see. He's shrouded, dwelling in unapproachable light. God was separate from us, outside of our creation, and for us to know him and to know what he's like, what he wants, he has to reveal it. And so that's exactly what Jesus did. Turn just a few pages to the right to 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1. And look at what Jesus brings to light at his coming when God was manifest in the flesh. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8. We read there, Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings of the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us. God has saved us and has called us according to a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and his grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. Here's a mystery. God, before he ever said, let there be light. God, before he ever created, already knew how he was going to give his grace to sinful, fallen human beings. Before time began, he knew about what he was going to do through his grace. But now, verse 10, look at this. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 10. But now has been revealed, manifest, by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and brought to life, brought to light, life and immortality through the gospel. What's Paul saying here in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 10? Jesus, when he steps onto the scene of humanity, he brings into the light for us to see life and immortality through the gospel. And this is awesome and this is good because 
Inside every human being, there are 7.5 billion of us on this planet right now, inside every human being is a desire to live and to live forever. You all have it. I have it. We all have this desire, this yearning. And so humanity's been seeking for it for a long time. You go back and read the myths of ancient times and you see the search for this, this life forever, the search for this well or fountain of youth. And it's throughout mythology, it's throughout story. Why? Because there's this desire, this yearning inside of us to live forever. Do you realize that right now, at this moment in Silicon Valley, there are huge venture capitalists that are putting hundreds of millions of dollars into startup companies that are trying to find the cure for death. They're trying to get rid of death. This last week, it was reported in the news that in China, Chinese surgeons have successfully done a head transplant on a cadaver from one cadaver to another cadaver, and they are saying that within the next year, 18 months, they should get to the point where they can take a, spirit, a, a, a mentally brain-dead individual whose body is functioning well, they can take a brain-dead individual and transplant a fully live head back onto that body of someone who's dying of some sort of internal disease, they can do a head transplant and can extend life. That's freaky. I mean, read Frankenstein. It can't lead to good things. But that's what we're doing. Why? Because there's a desire in us to live forever. And what did Jesus do when God was manifest in the flesh? He brings to light life and immortality. He shows us the way to immortality. And where does it come through? Through the gospel. Through the good news of who Jesus is and what Jesus did. Now, I get it. When you share this with someone, when I share this with someone, and I say, listen, God who created everything seen and unseen, he stepped down into this world. There is a God, and Jesus is God, and he came to give us immortality. People, when they hear this, they go, that's far out. Because it's a mystery, a great mystery. So they hear it and they go, just like Nicodemus in John chapter 3, this religious man, they have the same response. How can these things be? That's what they say. How can these things be? It's almost incredible what you're telling me. I want to believe it, but it's, it's unbelievable that God became a man to give us immortality like God? How, how is that even possible? Well, it's not merely because the Bible says so. For a long time, Christians, they, they, their answer to tough questions is to say, well, the Bible tells me so. That's not sufficient to just say, well, the Bible tells me so. How do we know that this is the fundamental truth upon which all other truths are tested? There is a God, Jesus is God, and he came to give life for eternity. We can know because of the second line of this, this little song here. God was manifest in the flesh. Second line, justified in the spirit. Another translation, English translation says vindicated in the spirit. Vindicated by the spirit. What does that mean? I think it means the same thing that Paul said in Romans chapter 1 verse 4 when he said this. Jesus was declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Jesus was vindicated, justified, proven to be God in human flesh by many signs and wonders. Most notably, Jesus rose from the dead. And we cognitively, intuitively know people who die don't come back to life. They don't raise from the dead. And yet 2,000 years ago, there was a man crucified on a cross outside of Jerusalem, buried in a tomb, dead. And three days later, there were witnesses, over 500 eyewitnesses to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And many of those witnesses died as martyrs, being tortured and killed. And they all professed, I have seen the risen Jesus. Jesus is God in human flesh vindicated, proven to be God by the resurrection from the dead. The hymn goes on. He says, he was manifest in the flesh. He was justified in the spirit and he was seen by angels. Seen by angels. Now, of the six lines of this doxology, this hymn, this is the one that seems most odd and out of place. Because there's a sense when you read it that Jesus, God, was seen by angels. There's a part of it where you just go, well, of course he was seen by angels. God is with the angels in heaven or wherever God is outside of this cosmos. The angels have been with him since their creation. Of course they have seen God. And yet, that assumption on our part 
is actually not supported by the scriptures. You see, Jesus in the Gospel of John chapter 8, he says, no one has seen God at any time. And I believe that no one includes the angels. You say, how could that possibly be? How could they be in the presence of God and not see him? Because of this that is revealed to us by the prophet Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 6, we read there, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. And above his throne stood angels, seraphim, and each one had six wings. With two he covered his face. With two they flew, and with two they covered their feet. Do you realize... The scriptures seem to tell us that the angels in the presence of God, because they're in such awe of his glory, cover their faces and have never looked upon God in eternity because they are so humbled by his holiness. And so that when God became a man, they were looking into these things, desiring to look into these things because they'd never beheld the glory of God before. And so they, with all of creation, We're able for the first time to behold the glory of God in the babe of Bethlehem. And so they intently looked into these things. They wanted to see these things. And so the glorious God was manifest in the flesh, incarnate. He was proven to be God, vindicated as God by the evidence of the Holy Spirit. He was seen by angels and therefore, the fourth line of the song, he was preached among the Gentiles. Point number four on your outline. Christ came to be proclaimed. Christ came to be proclaimed. Yes, at his coming, at his advent, he came to a little backwater town just outside of Jerusalem called Bethlehem, was born probably in a cave where animals were kept and laid in a manger in obscurity but he came to be proclaimed. And on the day he was born, angels proclaimed his birth. And ever since that time, we who have come to know him have been proclaiming him to all the world. He is preached among the nations, preached among the Gentiles. And this proclaiming of the coming of Christ, it didn't start at his birth, it started before that because prophets for centuries were foretelling that he was going to come, that he was going to come of the tribe of Judah, that he was going to be a descendant of David, that he was going to come to the city of Bethlehem, that he would be born to a virgin. All of these things for centuries, they said, he is coming because God is one of those gift givers that likes to give hints about his gift. So the entire time, he's given us hints about who he is and what he's going to do. In the coming of the Messiah, he is proclaimed among the Gentiles. For what purpose? Look at the fifth line of the song. Believed on in the world. We preach Christ for the purpose of people coming to faith in him. We proclaim who Jesus is and what Jesus has done so that others will put their trust in him. Not just a mental acknowledgement about who he might have been, not just a verbal acclamation of what he did, but an absolute wholesale trust in him. Why do we call people to trust in him? Because of what Paul says in, in Romans chapter 10, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be ashamed. We preach Christ among the nations so that he will be believed upon in this world for the salvation of the lost. One final line in this song, he was received up in glory. He was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. What does this mean? The tomb is empty. Whether you think the tomb that Jesus was born in is the tomb at the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem, or if you think it was the tomb outside of Jerusalem in the city, in the uh, place called Gordon's Calvary, or if it's some other tomb, wherever it is, the tomb is empty. On the day that Jesus rose from the dead, there are followers of Jesus that went to the tomb to anoint his body for burial, and when they got there, they found angels who announced to them, He is not here, He is risen. 
You can go to Medina and Saudi Arabia and visit the remains of Muhammad. You can go to the temples in Asia where the remains of Buddha have been scattered, the cremated remains, but you cannot find the remains of Jesus because he rose from the dead and ascended into heaven and he was received into glory. And one day, the scriptures foretell, he will come again. Point number five on your outline, we finish with this. We preach the living Christ and not a dead prophet. We preach the living Christ and not a dead prophet, which is one of the reasons that you can confidently invite people to come here because you will know that they will always hear the preaching of the risen, living Christ. God is. Jesus is God. And Jesus came to bring to light life and immortality through the good news that is to be preached throughout the world, to be believed by all people for the salvation of the lost, that they also will be received up to be with him in glory for eternity. That is good news. Would you stand with me as we close in prayer? Father, thank you for your word. It is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, and it is, Lord, that which brings understanding and light. And Lord, when we, when we understand this important fundamental truth, it changes everything about what is going on in this world. It helps us to understand reality in a better way. There are so many truths that are being thrown around as the potential fundamental truth and all of those change our understanding, our worldview of trying to figure out what this world is all about, this chaotic world. But you, Jesus, come and you say, this is the reality. God is. You, Jesus, are God. You came to give life for eternity. It changes everything. And God, I pray that we would hold this truth so close in our hearts that it would become our passion and that we would not be able to hold it back. We praise you, Jesus. It may be as we're standing here today that you have not received the salvation of Christ. You have not put your trust in him for salvation. I want to give you a chance this morning to do that if you never have. To simply ask in prayer for God's forgiving grace and for his Holy Spirit to come into your life to transform you and your future. If that's you, you want to receive his forgiving grace today, would you just lift up your hands high so I can see it? Anyone here today? I see you there in the middle in the back. God bless you. Anyone else? You want to receive that forgiving grace of Jesus to receive his salvation. Jesus came to give life forever. If that's you, would you just pray with me out loud where you're at? Prayer is just simply talking to God. Dear Jesus, I know that I need you. Would you come into my life? Forgive me of my sin. Help me to follow you by faith and to glorify you in this world. Thank you for your salvation. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. Let's sing to the Lord.